John chats with Kendra and Kat. Just a couple of girls talk about this and that. Getting familiar with Blue and the charmed ones too. John chats. Hello! Hello! Welcome to Charm Chats with Kendra and Kat. What? Yay! Yay! All right. We're at episode 111, which means we are halfway through the first season. Mm-hmm. I am so excited. It's all ones. Yes. So, so excited. Yay. Yay. Halfway through. Yay. That's, which that's... means we're like a six of the way through. Or, no, no, not a six. I don't know. I don't want to do math right now. That's fine. Wait, hang on. Eight we're... seasons. We're 16th. 16th of the way through. There we go. Okay, I ended up doing math. Even though I didn't want to. Whatever. It's alright. It Thank happens. Thank you, brain. It happens. Blue, can you do math? <laughs> he stopped licking his arm. He is confused, so that is a no. <laughs> no. Don't worry, you don't have to do math. Yeah. You'll never have to take calculus and feel my pain. <laughs> I didn't take calculus. But I wasn't very good at maths. So, today's episode is Feats of Clay, which... Weird title. Yeah. We, yeah. And it definitely evokes uh, an episode that happens in another three seasons that involves actual clay. I don't remember. You'll remember when we get there. Don't worry. Yep. Listeners, <laughs> listeners, next year. no doubt, no doubt listeners will already know what I am talking about, and you might realize it, like, in a week. Yeah. It's like, but that'll be next year, you know. I'm trying very hard not to think about episodes that are coming after the episodes we're watching, because I don't want to be, like, influenced by them. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, Feats of Clay originally aired January 20th, 1999. So we begin with an opening shot of the Sphinx and a pyramid. Are they Which really that close you. together? No. I, I didn't think so. No. But I couldn't, like, I didn't know if it was supposed to be, like, a forced perspective thing, or can you see one from the other? I don't know. We'll see if they're in the Maps app. I didn't research it or anything. I just, in my notes, I was like, are they really that close okay, together? Okay, there's a great pyramid. Oh, apparently they are fairly close. Two minutes. They're less than half a mile apart. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So you can see one from the other. I guess. Interesting. Thanks, map app. That is fascinating. All right. So we have learned something new already. Mm-hmm. That these Sphinx and the pyramid are that close together. The Great Pyramid, in fact. Fascinating. Quite. And then we get a little subtitle, Cairo, comma, Egypt, in case you didn't know, by the Sphinx and the Pyramid, you know. They're clearly trying to give it to the lowest common denominator of the audience. And then we get a shot of water with some buildings in the background, and a shot of a white building that looks like it could be anywhere in California. Yeah. Or perhaps, I don't know, in Egypt. Yeah. But in California. Yeah. Oh, but once inside, there's Egyptian statues and stuff. So it's got to be Egypt, right? Right. Right. Because everyone in Egypt has Egyptian statues and stuff in their house. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. A man smashes the glass on the door, reaches inside and opens the door, and I have never wanted someone to cut their arm so badly. <laughs> yeah, it it seemed like a little tempty. Yeah, a little with bit. fate. A little you know. bit. And he and another man enter with a third not too far behind them. And they're all wearing some sort of shade of khaki. But the second guy who's entering is wearing a blue shirt over top. He's the one we're supposed to remember because the episode is named after him. Oh, yeah. So, you know, he had to stand out. Yep. And blue makes you look trustworthy. Uh-huh. Especially when you're stealing shit. Yeah. So we have Dude 1, Clay, and Dude 2. That is how they are in my notes until they have names. <laughs> yep. So, dude one is like, piece of cake, right? I was like, I don't understand. Breaking glass is never a piece of cake. No. I don't understand that logic. I, whatever. They're probably just like, hey, we got in here, piece of cake, right? Not to the, like, specifically, hey, we broke a pane of glass, piece of cake. Yeah, I guess. So Clay is like, you know, let's just do this and get out of here. And this is when... This is when we learn his name is Clay, because Doom was like, relax, Clay. We get no one else's name in this entire scene, nope. but we get Clay. And we learn that no one is home and the owner is dead. As you do. Mm-hmm. And that's when Dude 2 tells Clay to stay there and keep watch, and they'll, they'll go get the urn. Uh-huh. 
house full of priceless artifacts, and they're after... A single urn. That we haven't even seen yet, so we don't know why exactly it is so special. Mm-hmm. And dude one and dude two walk into the other room while Clay stands at the doorway looking nervous. Because, you know... Yeah. And dude two is like, Clay doesn't know, does he? Like, this entire scene was just so... Yeah. I'm responding to your face. And I agree with your face. Yeah. Because there's no words. Oh, there are words. We just can't find them right now. Yeah. It's just the, the, the pained expression on my face. And yeah. So dude two is worried, making sure that Clay doesn't know about something. And dude one is like, you know, why spook him? He probably believes the curse killed the old man. And we learn that the old man was stung to death by a scorpion in the bathroom of an aeroplane. He doesn't say airplane. He says aeroplane. That's weird. Yeah. And we learn that Dude One's name is Wesley. Okay. So now Dude One has a name. Yeehaw. Dude One's like, you know, don't tell me you believe in that. And Dude Two is like, you think I'd be here if I did? You know. Yeah. As you do. And he sees the Because what, what do you do when you're breaking and entering and stealing an artifact that has a curse you don't believe in? You obviously talk about the curse. Of course. Because why wouldn't you? So we see the urn. It's a large urn, colored in a shade of blue. A kind of lapis lazuli blue. Yeah. Slightly cobalty. Mm-hmm. It's very pretty. There's a picture of a woman, like a sketch of a woman on the side. Yes, with a slightly different blue. Yep, a slightly lighter blue. Yeah. They walk over to the urn, and Wesley picks it up and asks if, if the other dude sees any scorpions around. And the picture of the woman on the side of the urn glows and disappears in a puff of CGI gold dust and smoke. Yes. Uh-huh. And the other guy is like, no, just dollar signs, let's go. And Clay comes up to them and says that there's a car coming because they must have tripped an alarm. People have silent alarms. Yeah. That's a thing. Absolutely. And so they run the opposite way than the way that they came in, and a CGI cloud of gold dust shows up behind them, and two guards come running through, and we get some interesting shots of statues outside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Clay, Wesley, and dude number two are hiding behind some plants. You know, as, as you, you do. do. Yeah. I think that's probably more common than a la convenience for us. As you do? Yeah. Yeah, well, we, we now have the three. We have a la convenience, as you do, and exposition time. Yes. And all three of those will make wonderful t-shirts someday. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So they decide to split up and meet back in San Francisco. And for some reason, they decide to hand the urn itself to Clay. Well, because apparently Clay has a friend that can hawk the urn. Don't you love that word? And my favorite is Dude 2 goes, Don't you think of ripping us off because I'll find you. And Will just he? like, just like the, the way that he says it is just so campy. It's so bad. It's horrible. Yeah. So Dude 2 runs off one way, Clay goes the other, and Wesley starts walking away, but stops when he sees the magic dust floating in the air in front of him. And he is doing a horrible job of acting scared. Yep. Horrible. Horrible job. Or even really, like, startled. He just kind of looks like, huh? Yeah, it was bad. So then the dust coalesces, turns into a woman wearing a stereotype of an Egyptian, like, Cleopatra-type outfit. Yeah, clearly a white actress. Yes. I will talk about the actress in a second. This outfit. It's a large gold headpiece with lots of bits and bobs on. A neck piece in golds and blacks. A gold lame shawl that covers her shoulders and just covers her boobs. Like, literally just right in front of, of the, the boobs. boobs. Yep. A gold overskirt with a black underskirt and a bit of gold down the middle front. There's a couple of different pictures of the outfit on the website, but this is like the only time that we see a full body shot. This actress is a woman named Stacy Hyduke. She's been in a bunch of stuff, but I remember her most from Kindred the Embraced. It was an Aaron Spelling show based on Vampire the Masquerade that had a single season back in 1996. And it only went off the air because the lead actor died in a car crash. And it's a little hard to recast a vampire who's supposed to live forever. This is true. Yeah. More current fans might know her as Jenny from True Blood, which made me laugh that she was in yet another show about vampires. So yeah, so he's doing a horrible bit of acting. He asks, what are you? Which I think is funny. Not who are you? No, no. What are you? Well, he saw her appear. I guess. And she says that she is the guardian of the urn and her voice has like a bit of an echo to it. Like she's talking yeah. into a cup. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. It was a little, 
a little odd. And he's like, the what? And she touches her ring, which looks like a spider. Mm-hmm. And there's some CGI gold glowing that's happening. And then she touches Wesley's chest. And he's, you know, what are you doing? And a spider appears and it is crap CGI. Yes. Yeah, it like is some outlined kind of in purple. Oh my God. Yeah. Like what? I think this is the worst CGI that we've had so far is a CGI spider tarantula thing that is, it was literally outlined in purple. Like it was, it was worse than laser eyes. Yes. Worse than laser eyes. Really? Yes. Okay. But so he starts yelling in pain and falls to the floor and dude too looks on from the bushes and the guardian says, you are being punished for your greed. And then she looks at dude too. Super like chill too yeah and then she looks at dude too in the bushes and says as will your friends and then he runs away yeah and then we cut to a lovely nighttime bridge shot and in case you needed to know the subtitle is san francisco three days later which okay i understand the three days later that's fine but did we really need san francisco no we didn't really really didn't but they gave us cairo so they had to give us san francisco of course they did and then we get the manor. And Piper and Phoebe are walking down the stairs, and when they reach the bottom of the stairs, Prue's standing there. And I can't see any of the pants on any of the girls at this point, because of the way that they had the camera. But Piper is in a tannish brownish shirt. Phoebe is in a wine-colored spaghetti strap top, because she loves those spaghetti straps. Yep. And Prue is in a grayish long sleeve cropped top that has some sort of pattern on it. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Prue is all about the crop tops. They're all all about the crop tops. Well, no. Prue and Phoebe are about the crop tops. I don't think Piper wears crop tops. I think we had one episode so far where she had a top that was cropped. Did she? I think there was an episode where all three of them were wearing something. Huh. I don't remember Piper in a crop top. Hmm. Interesting. But whatever. We learned that Clay is New York Clay. Mm-hmm. That apparently Phoebe never wanted to see again. And we get a cute sister moment where, you know, Piper says, you know, you never wanted to see him again. And Phoebe's like, ancient history. And Piper's like, six months? <laughs> Which is just, it was just so perfectly done. Yeah. I like great. that we're finally getting a little bit of Phoebe backstory, like, without the sisters. Mm -hmm. Just shit happened to her in New York. Yeah. What happened to her in New York? Exactly. Because she's clearly been there for a few years. Yeah. She probably went there when she was like 18 or something. Possibly. Don't know. But we learned from Phoebe that it was only five months, which still isn't ancient history, but you know. <laughs> nope. But it was the line of ancient history and we started the episode in Cairo. It was just, it was funny. Yeah. It was very funny. And we learned that he's apparently stopping by. He was traveling, whatever. And Prue wants to know who Clay is. And Phoebe's automatically like nobody because, no. you know, for some reason. Well, she didn't tell Prue before. She's certainly not about to now. Yeah. Not let Prue judge her for her romantic indiscretions. Hey, you know. So Piper chimes up with the fact that Clay is Phoebe's ex. He's a musician. And she met him while she was working at the Rainbow Room. Prue is, of course, confused. She's like, wait, you worked at the Rainbow Room? Well, yeah. She was the hostess until she started working at the Chelsea Pier. Apparently Phoebe has worked a lot of iconic places. Uh-huh. And probably not for very long at any of them. Oh, but the doorbell rings. And before she goes to get the door, Phoebe's like, do I have lipstick on my teeth? And Piper says yes. So she starts rubbing her teeth and heads toward the door. And a cute sister moment that looked so completely genuine was Prue said, you know, that was mean. Piper's like, that was not mean. And Prue's like, okay. <laughs> and like that three line scene, that little moment between Piper and Prue just seemed the most genuine like sister bonding that I have seen between those two since we started this show. It was great. So Phoebe opens the door and Clay is standing there wearing a black shirt under a black jacket and they say hi and whatever and they hug and Phoebe has a premonition of her and Clay in bed together. A fun but useless premonition mm -hmm. is what I wrote down. Yep. It ends. She smiles. They stop hugging. And he's like, you okay? She goes, uh-huh. Whew. <laughs> yep. And then we get the opening credit. After the opening credits, the song that is playing is Inside Out by Eve Six. Or, if you were listening to it on Netflix, it sounded like it fit well, that's in good. there. So I wrote, this one sounds original, or at least sounds like something that would be. Oops, not original. One Night by Cat's Company. All right. K-A-T-Z. And it was written in 2009. Well, all right then. I Shazammed it. Well, you're lucky it showed up on Shazam. I know. Yeah. I'm very lucky it showed up on Shazam, but it fit. It wasn't quite so jarring. Well, that's good. But it was written 10 years after the fact. 
Yes. But, you know. But yeah, the original song was Inside Out by Eve Six. I remember Eve Six, I think. I remember the name. Yeah, so apparently Eve Six started in 1995. They broke up in 2004, got back together in 2007. Broke up again? Technically, they are still together, but they haven't released a new album since 2012. Apparently, Inside Out was the first single from their debut album released in May of 98. So that is why it wound up on the show. Undishu! <laughs> All right, so then we get some new bread shots. We have a close-up of cars driving along before zooming out. Mm -hmm. Then an action shot driving on the bridge. Then a shot of the bridge from behind some trees looking down the middle of it, gradually showing more and more traffic on the bridge. Then the weirdest of the opening shots, a push into the skyline over the water through the bridge. To grandmother's house we go. Mm -hmm. Then we get that overhead shot of the triangle building that we've had before, before getting a panning shot from looking at the triangle building to watching a streetcar come up the road before getting an actual streetcar shot. So that brings our total of streetcars up to 12. Wait, no, I'm counting the one in the distance. It brings it up to 13. Woo! And then we get an outside establishing shot of Quake, but no floral skirt lady. No. So sad. And Piper and Prue are sitting at the bar, and Piper is in her usual Quake outfit, which is, you know, the white button-down shirt and black pants. And Prue is in a fuzzy blue hoodie, but I can't see her pants yet. Right, Blue? Yeah. You comfy? So Prue wants to know what else she doesn't know. And Piper has a lovely line saying, don't take this personally, but sometimes you can be a bit judgmental. And Prue's like, that's not true. And Piper gives her a look. Yeah. She's like, all right, so maybe it's sometimes true. <laughs> but she wants to know, you know, she doesn't understand why Phoebe wouldn't tell her. And Piper's like, you know, people don't like to dwell on things that end badly. And Prue comes back with, I wish my relationships ended that badly. Did you hear them last night? <laughs> it was great. And, you know, she says, there was music, there was wine. And Piper's like, talking? How do you know there was wine? And Prue's like, I peeked. Nobody tells me anything. I have to get creative. That's not creative, Prue. That's stalkery. A little bit. A little bit. Okay, Blue. Piper tells her to stop worrying that everything will be fine. And a waitress walks past, and she and the bartender look at each other. And then the bartender drops a tray of glasses he was holding. But Piper freezes them before they hit the ground. Mm. And Piper tells Prue to watch the entrance and make sure no one comes in. And she walks around the bar and picks the glasses up out of midair and straightens the tray and then puts the glasses back on the tray. Now, is it just me? Or when she picks up the glasses from midair, they sound like glass. But when she puts them down on the tray, they sound like plastic. <laughs> it was, I'm certain the glass sound was 80 yard. Oh, I'm positive of that. Which is why I am confused as to why they sounded like clinking glass in the air and plastic glasses hitting a tray when she put them down. Well, the plastic sound probably wasn't 80 yard. Yeah, I don't know. But he unfreezes and we get a funny little moment between them where she's like, you know, whoa, Doug, easy. And he thanks her and is like, I hope Shelly didn't see that. So we learned that the bartender's name is Doug. The waitress's name is Shelly. Yeah, it was a cute thing. Like this entire episode, the Doug and Shelly storyline is my favorite and it saddens me because we never see them again. Well, no, that's not completely true. I think we see one of them in like the next episode. I don't remember. But that's it. Like one of them. But she tells him not to worry and she sits back down. Now I want to know why he wasn't freaking out that Piper just appeared in front of him. Was he just too worried about Shelly the waitress? Possibly. Yeah, I don't know. And then we get exposition time from the sisters. Yay! That's new. Yeah. Prue asks, you know, what was that? The guy, the glass, you know, do you often freeze time in front of, oh, I don't know, let's say everybody? It's a funny line. And we learn that Piper is finally getting some control over the unfreezing and that Doug just keeps dropping everything. And Prue says that, you know, maybe she should just fire him. Piper says that the owner says that she should fire him and actually threaten to fire Piper if she doesn't fire him. But the Doug's just going through a hard time right now because Shelly, the waitress, dumped him after six years of dating. And so Prue's like, what? You're playing Cupid at the risk of your own job. And Piper said, you know, yeah, well, you know, Doug loves her. He even bought an engagement ring and he just waited too long to ask. So now he's a wreck. Now yeah. I have never yeah. understood this shit. You want to be with this person for the rest of your life, but they haven't asked you to marry them. So you break up with them. In what universe does that make sense? In stupid hetero people universe? Yeah. 
Because I just, I don't... Like, I understand ultimatums, but, like, that's not a you do the thing. It's, hey, like, hello, here's what I expect. If you do not do what I expect, then here is what will happen. Yeah, like, I under I would understand it if it was... We've been dating for six years. Is this relationship going anywhere? Yeah. And if not, let me know so we can leave the relationship. Right. But don't just be like, you know, we've been together six years. You haven't asked me to marry you, so I'm dumping you. Well, I mean, granted, we can't exactly tell from Piper what the conversation was between the two of them. So it might have been more, hey, we've been dating for six years. If you don't ask me to marry you, I'm leaving. I'm out. And But I don't think that conversation happened. Because especially at the end of the episode, we'll get there when we get there and we'll bring this up again. But like, yeah, I don't think that conversation happened between them. So yeah, Pri says that she can't keep freezing things in order to protect him, and Piper says she knows, and then she literally waves that thought away by waving in the air, and asks if Pri is still going back to Buckland's, and she's like, yeah, that's where I work. <laughs> yep. And Piper's like, you know, well, after everything that happened with Rex and Hannah, you know, I thought that you would be hitting the classifieds. And she says that if they don't save the auction house, that she might have to look for a new job. Yeah. And she starts to say something about Rex, and Doug comes out of the kitchen carrying plates. He trips, and Piper freezes him. And Pew just comes up with, bankrupt. And Piper's like, what were you saying? <laughs> She's like, never mind, I gotta go. And so Prue leaves, and Piper walks over to Doug, shaking her head. Just puts her hands on her hips. Yeah, it's adorable. And then we cut to, look, another streetcar! Total's now at 14! And Clay and Phoebe are walking in a park. And this outfit. So we get Phoebe in clunky shoes, jeans, and a dark red jacket with fuzzy collar and cuffs. I think we've seen that jacket before. I don't know. I don't remember this jacket. The jacket seems uh, very familiar. I don't remember a jacket with fuzzy collar and cuffs. I don't know whether it was this show or not, but I think it was this show. I don't know, but I can't see the shirts that she has on underneath the jacket. But we'll get there. Yeah. She'll take off we'll the jacket there. later. Yeah. Clay is wearing jeans, a greenish gray polo shirt, a leather jacket, and brown dress shoes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And he's telling her about Egypt, saying that she would have loved it. And he mentions that they had camel taxis. And she's like, you rode a camel? And he says that they're friendlier than some of the cab drivers that he's met. <laughs> and she comes back with, can't imagine they're faster. <laughs> Which was funny. And then they look at each other and he says that she was right to leave him. And she comes with, with a great line of, ooh, and the conversation turns. Yeah. Which was just great. And he says that he's serious, that she was the best thing that ever happened to him. And we get a little bit more back and forth between them. And she wants to know why he's really there. He's like, what, a guy can't visit? And... She does a cute little thing. She goes, you're not just a guy, you're Clay. And she hits him with her purse. It was adorable. It was so funny. Like, it was a playful little hit, but it was adorable. And she says, you know, that Clay comes with strings attached. And he says he could never hide anything from her. And she said, actually, you could. That was one of our problems. <laughs> Which was great. And so that's when he mentions the urn, saying that he picked it up at an overseas market. Sure he did. Uh-huh. And thought it might be worth something. And so that's when she realizes that he wants her to get Prue to help because of the auction house. And we get a couple more back and forth from them. And he's, you know, making sure of, you know, please help me, that kind of thing. And we get an exterior shot of Buckland's. And Prue walks into her office and we can now see that under her blue fuzzy hoodie is a black shirt and she's wearing black pants. And I should have assumed that because like 90% of the time these girls are in black pants. Mm -hmm. And a woman wearing a brown suit, jacket, and skirt is going through her files. Now I want to know, did we figure out what we were going to call those? Were they skirt suits instead of pants suits? Yeah, I think so. Is that what we said? Yeah, skirt we're just going to say that pants suits are just suits and then anything with a skirt is a skirt suit. Okay. So she's wearing a brown skirt suit. Yeah. Yes. And I had completely forgotten about her existence. Mm-hmm. And then it all came flooding back to me. Yes. Oh, boy. Yes. Hi, Claire. Yes. Claire Price. Who works at an auction house. Uh -huh. I should, wait, what have I done? Claire Price works at the bank. Bit on the nose. Bit on the nose. A little bit. But this actress is Christine Rose. Yes. Who most people will know as Angela Petrelli from Heroes. Or as Ted's mother in How I Met Your Mother. That's I think that's more how I know her. Yeah. Well, I know her from Heroes. I, I think there are other things I know her from, like 90s she was, era. She was on a couple of episodes of Gilmore Girls. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. Which ones? She played Francine Hayden. 
Oh, yeah. In Christopher's Christ- mom. Christopher returns in 2001 and Dear Emily and Richard in 2003. So there you go. <laughs> but yeah, so we learn that she is Claire Price and that the bank assigned her to see if the business is worth salvaging. And she says that she's looking for the inventory records because the file in her predecessor's office were empty. Yeah, of course they were. And Prue says, yes, well, Rex and Hannah weren't exactly qualified, which is... An understatement, if I have ever heard oh, one. Oh my goodness. It is the understatement of all understatements. Uh-huh. And Claire says that she doesn't know anything about auction houses and even less about art, but that they have to move $1.2 million worth of inventory at the auction tomorrow, or she's shutting the place down. Which promptly freaks Prue the hell out. Yeah. And which we get the funniest thing. Prue says, wait, did you say tomorrow? And Claire comes back with, did I stutter? <laughs> Which is my favorite comeback. I love that comeback. I yep. think this might be where I got that comeback. Yep. I love it. I want to know how she calculated that. Well, she knows the bottom line. Well, obviously she knows the bottom line, but like this auction house has been going for, let's say, well, okay, the actual Hannah and Rex died in August of 98. Mm -hmm. So we'll assume the auction house officially started then and they just, you know, magicked up a bunch of loopholes to make it happen. Well, no, I'm thinking that the auction house has been around for a while. Could be. Like, I don't think that the auction house was like an invention, that it was an actual auction house. Well, at any rate, Rex and Hannah had been running it. Yes. Probably since August. Yes. And if they did jack shit while all the assistants and secretaries and crap did all of their jobs Mm -hmm. to keep up appearances, but they would just delegate off onto everyone else. And didn't Andy say something in the last episode about, like, making it all a big heist or something, like, siphoning money off of... Yeah. Yeah. So they were probably doing a little bit of that just to be able to do whatever they wanted, Mm -hmm. like, buy tickets to the Verve. Yeah. And gotta wonder how much the company would have suffered that they still would have been able to be in business after five months. Don't know. And only need 1.2 million at a single auction? Don't know. Was that all that Rex and Hannah siphoned off? Maybe. It sounds like a big number when you're a kid at that age, but it's really not. Yeah, I I don't know. But Pris says that, you know, you don't just decide to throw an auction. You need advance notice, a catalog, and buyers. And Claire's like, then it looks like you have a lot of work ahead of you, doesn't it? And she heads toward the door, but she stops short as Phoebe and Clay walk around the corner. And Phoebe's like, sorry. (laughs) And Claire leaves, and Phoebe and Clay walk in, and he's carrying the urn. And Phoebe asks who that was, and Prue comes back with, the new sheriff. (laughs) Which was funny. It was just, it was cute. Yeah, Claire is very authoritarian, where Rex was just, like, not. Yeah. Really not. Not. Not so much. More anarchy. Yeah. Trying bit. to pretend like he's a capitalist. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have a good metaphor for that. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know. So Phoebe says, you know, that, that Clay was hoping you could sell the urn for him, and he says he picked it up at a market overseas. And Prue goes, picked it up? Does that mean you bought it? And Phoebe says, you know, what else could it mean? Like, <laughs> Yeah, like, th- this little scene, again, doesn't seem like a scene that should be this far into the season. Yeah. Like, this scene seems like something way earlier in the season because of the way that she's still treating Phoebe. Yeah. But, I mean, I could excuse it, like, Prue's never met anyone that knew Phoebe when she was in New York who clearly had a history with her. I don't yeah. know if... Did Prue ever meet the um, hammock hunk, or was that just Piper? Because I think Prue was probably at Buckland's, like, the entire fucking time. The hammock hunk. Wasn't that during the Love Spell episode? Yeah, yes. no, he, was, he came into the kitchen and dropped the milk bottle into the recycling, remember? Yes, but was Prue there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so she, she met the hammock hunk, but Phoebe clearly didn't have a history with hammock hunk. Yeah. Why didn't we call him hammock hunk during the episode? I don't know. What the fuck was his name? Wasn't it Hans? Yes. Yeah, it was Hans. All right. Sure. Prue kind of brushes that off and says that the urn is beautiful, and we get an insert shot of the urn, and this time we are shown a sketch of a scorpion on the urn. And she says that it's gold inlay, 24 carat, a lot of lapis, looks to be from Egypt. And he's like, yeah, that's exactly where I was traveling. Yeah, unfortunately, Uh HD definitely ruins her description because you can see it's just like a painted urn with some kind of weird, like, chalky finish. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not. No, there's no way there's lapis lazuli in that thing. No. Like, they didn't even find an enameled thing. Just. Yeah, no. It doesn't look good. And the gold looks like gold leaf. It didn't even look like gold leaf to me. Oh, it yeah. looked like metallic paint. Yeah, it looked like gold leaf, but like badly done gold leaf. Yeah. Yeah. Like metallic paint that was meant to look like gold leaf. Yeah. Like metallic spray paint. Yeah, maybe. Anyway. But yeah, so she says that the etching is quite interesting, that it's very unusual, and that she'd have to determine the urn's origins and its previous owners, and Phoebe's like, can't you just skip a step or two? And I love love that Prue comes back with, I cannot risk this auction house's reputation with something like this without checking on it first. As though the reputation wasn't already ruined by the two previous owners, just like skipping town. Exactly. Well, allegedly skipping town. Yeah. Or, not allegedly, ostensibly, skipping town yeah. and having, like, siphoned off money for months. Yeah. Also, previous owners having been murderers. True. But then we get a cute sister moment where Phoebe's like, you know, come on, you know, I'll I'll, I'll cook you dinner. And Prue comes back with, okay, don't threaten me. I'll see yeah. what I can do. <laughs> Which was just great. Clay says thanks, and Phoebe hugs Prue, and Phoebe and Clay link arms and leave, and Prue just stares down at the urn. Which is kind of funny. <laughs> and then we cut to outside as Phoebe and Claire are leaving, and we get a tiny glimpse of the red top that she's wearing under the jacket. Little red top. Tiny glimpse of it. And Clay thanks her for helping him, and Phoebe's like, you know, no problem. She can probably get a good price for it because she's really good at her job. You yeah, know. well, she was basically carrying that auction house for five months. Basically. Yeah. And they're still chatting a little bit as they walk away, and then Dude 2 walks up behind them and is like, hey, Clay. And this is where we get Palmer. Which is a really good name for a thief. Okay. Palmer. Palm stuff? Yeah. Got it. He's wearing a gray t-shirt and a brown jacket, as you do. You know, gotta Mm -hmm. try and fit in. Clay asks what he's doing here, and he says, I'm bumping into you, which was kind of funny. (laughs) So Palmer asks, you know, if Clay's going to introduce him to the girl he's with, you know. And he does, and says he met Palmer in Cairo. And Palmer wants to know what's going on with the urn. And Phoebe's like, you know about the urn? And Clay's like, yeah, that's that's where we met. You know, in the marketplace where I bought it. Nah. Mm-hmm. Let me just scramble to find a cover story because Palmer is a dick. And he didn't think, hey, maybe I should exercise some fucking tact. Yeah. And he asked you, I thought you were going to sell it. And Clay's like, well, you know, Phoebe's sister works at the auction house. She's looking at buyers as we speak, you know. And I'm just like looking at it going, you know, we just walked out of an auction house. Yeah. The fact that you found me in the entirety of San Francisco, you found me and you found me outside an auction house. Yep. Just saying. Could have inferred just. some information. Yeah, well, but. Information. It doesn't work verbally. No, not so much. But then there are a lot of puns that don't work. Written. Very true. Mm-hmm. So Palmer seems a bit on edge, and Phoebe asks if he's okay. He's like, yeah, just tired, jet lag, you know. And he asks Clay if he's staying at the Ashcroft, like he suggested. Sounds like a fancy name for a hotel. Sounds like a fancy name for a motel. Yeah. Well, and Clay's like, yeah, sure. And Palmer's like, okay, maybe we'll hook up later. And he says, nice to meet you to Phoebe. They shake hands and he leaves. But she doesn't get a vision off of him, which I thought was very interesting. No. She didn't. Granted, the so far the only vision she's had thus far in this episode has been up banging Clay. Yeah. But you'd think that, like, if she's actually supposed to help these people, that she would have gotten a vision. Well, Palmer and Wesley are being punished for their greed. Clay? Well, she's a bit clouded. I understand. I guess so. But yeah, so as he walks away, she's like, ew, creepy guy. Yeah. And Clay even says, yeah. And he's like, you hungry? And they walk off. Yep. It was funny. I don't know. It just struck me funny. So we cut to an airport. Palmer walks up to a customs officer. There's a big wooden box. And the officer asks if he can help him. And he says that he was a friend of Wesley's and his family just wanted to to make sure he got home all right. And for some reason, the customs officer asks how he died. Because they don't. They don't normally care about that sort of stuff. Yeah. And Palmer's like, I don't know, spider bite, I think. Yeah. Which, you know, is just kind of funny because he was there when it happened. So, you know, and we learned that Wesley's body is off to JFK on the first flight in the morning. Now, here's my question. 
Mm -hmm. The flight from Cairo would not go across all of Asia and then all of the Pacific to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. At the most direct, you would have a flight from Cairo going to America to the East Coast. So JFK, Atlanta, LaGuardia, like DC, somewhere. You would have the East Coast. I don't know. You might stop off at Charles de Gaulle, but you ain't gonna go all the way from Cairo to San Francisco. I don't know. That is, as far as I know, not a sensible flight. You certainly would- Okay, you wouldn't go over Asia that way, and you probably wouldn't go across all of the United States. No, you would have gone to JFK already. This is just- Well- This is an a la convenience moment. Well, yeah. It's absolutely an a la convenience moment. I mean, there's no way around that. But yeah, so then the customs officer leaves and Palmer touches the box and says sorry to Wes. Walks off. Uh And then the camera pans down to show on the other side of the box is that seal with the guardian of the urn on it. Uh Uh-huh. And then it dissipates into some gold dust. It does indeed. And the guardian of the urn just kind of appears for a moment. And then we get commercial break. And we get a quick bridge shot at twilight, Mm -hmm. which is quite pretty, before we head back to Buckland's. And we're in Prue's office, and she's on the phone talking to Piper, and she's like, what am I supposed to think? Phoebe's ex pops into town and wants me to sell something for him. How is that a coincidence? And we cut to Piper at Quake, who has added a black vest to her outfit for some reason. She wants to look classy. Yeah. And I love the line that she comes back with with, you wonder why you're out of the loop. (laughs) <laughs> like, it was funny. She says, you know, she worries too much. And then we cut back to Prue, and this entire conversation cuts back and forth depending on who's talking. And Prue's like, you know, I just don't want to see her get hurt. And that she gets a really bad feeling about Clay, but she just can't explain it. And Piper's like, I can. You know, you don't think he's good enough for her. Just like you didn't think Jeremy was good enough for me. And in my course. case, you were right. Yeah. But yeah. that's not the point. Exactly. And Prue's like, no, your point is that it's none of my business, and you're probably right. And she goes, Speaking of playing matchmaker, how's Doug? <laughs> and Piper says that he is the same, unfortunately, and that she's getting freeze frazzled because it's so draining. <laughs> and I love Prue's just like, don't you think you better find a better way to deal before you get fired? And she's like, I know. And then she sees Doug coming, you know, gotta go and hangs up on Prue. And Shelly walks past Doug and he knocks a vase over and drops a tray of cutlery. And Piper tries to freeze him, but she can't. And we <laughs> get the best line (laughs) sorry doug too poop to pop yes it was great i absolutely loved that line and then we get a night shot of the manor and we see that phoebe and clay are eating chinese food in front of a roaring fire Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now we can see that the shirt that she was wearing under the jacket is red long-sleeved with tiny scalloped edges at the collar yeah So Clay is apparently surprised that she moved back because he remembers late nights, beers, and a few not-so-pleasant conversations about her sisters. But now they're living together again, and he wants to know if it was necessity or choice. And she says that it's a little bit of both. San Francisco is hella expensive. More than New York. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Although probably, would it have been at this time? I don't know, because I have never lived in either place. Neither have I, but... So I don't know... I know San Francisco lately has really been skyrocketing. Yeah. But New York has always been expensive. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hmm. I know not. But yeah, she says that San Francisco has been a lot more unusual than New York. And she tries to change the subject by asking if he wants more rice, which I thought was funny. Yeah. And he's like, no thanks, you know, but that you haven't said much about what you've been doing. And she says, protecting the innocent from evil. Be serious. Yeah. And she gives a knowing look and he says, you know, that she barely had a spare minute in New York, that she had three jobs just to afford her social calendar. And she says, you know, that things have changed, that she's changed. And he says he's trying to change. And the one thing that won't change is how I feel about you. And they kiss. Of course they do. And I think there was a Sarah McLaughlin song playing in the background. IMDb said it was Good Enough by Sarah McLaughlin, but that's not a song that I know very well. I don't remember hearing it, but I know I know Sarah McLaughlin quite well. So yeah, so they stop kissing, and Phoebe lets out like a little noise. And she, she's getting all hot and bothered. Yeah. And she knows where this is going. And granted, he probably does too. Yeah. But you know, he doesn't know where it's going. Yes. 
And for some reason, she's a little embarrassed. Well, you know, because she kind of says, you know, that, that it took a long time to get over him. Yeah. So, you know, I, I get that. Because when you, when you finally gotten over someone and then they come back into your life, you're just like, well, fuck. You know, I totally get that. And he jokes saying, you know, if I clean up my act, would you consider moving back? And she's like, don't go there. And then Prue walks in and is like, sorry to interrupt. And she was like, it's okay. It happens. Which was funny because they kept interrupting her and Andy. So it's, you know, that funny back and forth. And Clay's like, you know, I should get back to the hotel. And he stands up and starts cleaning up the containers of Chinese food. And Phoebe stops him and is like, you know, don't worry. I got it. I got it. And Clay asks how it's going with the urn. And she comes back with, it's going. Mm -hmm. And Phoebe says, I think what he's trying to ask is, is it going, going, gone? (laughs) Which was funny. Lovely auction humor. Yep. And she says that she put it on the auction block, but that she's still waiting for the background check to come through so that she can set a reserve price. And he says that, you know, whatever she gets for it is fine. And she comes back with, as long as it sells and in a hurry. And he says, from what I understand, if anyone can do it, it's you. But, you know, she doesn't seem all that convinced. And Clay kisses Phoebe and says that he'll call her tomorrow and that she can show him around the city to let him see where he left his heart. And Prue pulls the best face. Yes. Like, yes, I definitely oh my one. God, the best face. It was wonderful. It was gorgeous. Yes. And they kiss again and then they head to the front door. And as Clay leaves, we see that Phoebe's shirt is sheer and it's over like a darker cami, which I didn't realize that until we see her walking to the door. And we can see Alyssa's back tattoo. Yep. Gotta love it. It's gorgeous. Gotta love gorgeous. it. Gorgeous. Yep. And Phoebe locks the door and Prue looks at her. And she was like, what? She was like, I can worry about my little sister, can't I? And she comes back with, don't ever stop, which was a cute moment. It was very nice. And then they hear a small explosion come from the attic. (laughs) And they go up to the attic and they walk in to smoke in the attic. And Piper is there doing a spell. And she's wearing like a baseball jersey kind of style shirt. Yeah. That's white on the torso and black on the arms with light wash jeans. And we have cute sister moment. Prue says, are you okay? And Piper's like, nothing to see here. Move along. And Phoebe comes back with, welcome to London. <laughs> because of all the smoke. Yep. It's foggy up in here. It was very funny. And she says that she put a charm on Doug, but that she doubled the recipe. Because he needs so much help. Uh-huh. Something to boost his confidence so he can give love a shot and give, give me, me a break. break. It was wonderful. And we get the best line. Phoebe's like, go ahead, Prue, yell at her. (laughs) Which is great. Piper says it's not for personal gain, that Prue's the one that told her to do something. And Prue's like, did not. (laughs) (laughs) And then for some reason we have ADR. Yeah. Which I'm not sure, like, did, did the line not sound right or did they have to add something? I don't know. But we can speculate on it for years. Yeah. But Piper says that she needs Doug to stop dropping things so she can stop freezing things because she's exhausted. And Prue's like, well, maybe he and Shelly aren't meant to be together. Not everyone's supposed to be. And Phoebe comes back with, oh, that was, that real was real subtle, subtle Prue. Prue. Yeah. It was great. Like, this entire scene is just adorable. Because then Piper's, you know, we'll never know unless Doug gets the guts to pop the question. And that, you know, I'm giving him those the guts to do it, whatever. And Phoebe's like, it's just like the cowardly lion from the Wizard of Oz. And they both kind of stare at her and she's like, like well, it is. Yeah. It was super, super cute. She gets this, like, little hand-to-mouth gesture. It was just so cute. Mm-hmm. Super duper cute. And then we get an exterior shot of Buckland's. And look, there's the, the lady with the red umbrella and the, the yep. woman in the brown suit. Yep. Uh-huh. And in the auction room, a woman in a long black skirt and lab coat, for some reason, didn't understand the lab coat thing, but, you know, she's holding a statue, and the auctioneer in an ill-fitting suit, of course. tells us what it is. And there's another guy on the other side who's also in a lab coat. So, Oh, you know what video I saw this week? What? Auctioneers set to rap beats. Yes. Granted, these were not, like, auction house auctioneers. Mm-hmm. These were, like, you know, cowboy hat. Yeah, hillbilly hill, auctions. Like, state fair auctioneers. Yeah, but it is very funny. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It's hilarious. It's so good. Super good. So yeah, so the auctioneer is telling us what the statue is, and we see Prue walking up to a guy who we learn is a guy named Mark. (laughs) But because he doesn't have any lines... He'll he'll be fine, yeah. Yeah. She's wearing 
a greenish sweater that has fuzzy trim and cuffs, and it's kind of like a leopard print on yeah, the that's, trim. That's fucking weird. Super weird. And her pants were like brown, whatever. Well, it goes with green. Yeah. So she tells Mark, the extra with no lines, to move the pen to the next slot because one of the buyers is getting restless. And he leaves, and Claire comes up in a gray suit. She's holding a sheet of paper, gives it to Prue, and it's the appraisal for the urn. And she says, the good news is it's worth a fortune. We don't learn how much a fortune is, Mm -hmm. but given that the tiara was over a million dollars, I can only imagine this one is over three grand. Yeah, I don't know. But the bad news is... It's stolen. Uh Uh-huh. And... Claire is, of course, taking this as a bad sign about how things at the auction house are done. And mm-hmm. It's it's definitely not typical, but, you know, Prue saying that doesn't exactly convince Claire of anything. Exactly. So That's... Prue has the genius plan to magic the two cards in front of Lutz, like, 51 and 52, uh-huh. switch them, yep. and then before what would have been Lot 51, the urn, can be sold just plucks off the table and runs. Yes. Which leads to a really funny moment of the auctioneer saying, hey, this is a really special thing. It's an Egyptian urn with lebs and gold inlay. And you see there's a painting. Yes. And then he has a laugh and he's like, oh, that, that never happens. Yep. There's been some kind of mistake. But there was a small continuity error. Of course there was. In Well, because the chick in the lab coat was picking up the pen from the table to show it off as Prue was going for the urn. Mm-hmm. So that should have been the next item up for sale as opposed to the next item that was just sold. But when Prue leaves, he's up to, you know, lot number 51, the urn. So then why was she picking up the pen? Because if the pen was the the thing that was just sold, she should have been putting it back down on the table, not picking it up from the table. I don't know. Just saying. Little continuity. Tiny bit. Teeny, teeny tiny. Mm-hmm. Un poquito, if you will. Anyway. So then we cut to Prue's office. Prue walks in, and Palmer is there, and he is lurking in a corner, because that's not creepy or anything. No, no, not creepy. And, you know, by the way, brown shirt, black pants, because I had to. Isn't he in the same outfit? Yeah, I I don't think so, because he was wearing a jacket before, wasn't he? Oh, he was wearing gray earlier. Yeah. So she asks who he is, and he's like, you must be Prue, Phoebe's sister. And she's like, same question, who are you? (laughs) Which is funny. And he says he's a friend of Clay's, and... Asks, you know, why didn't you sell the urn? You were supposed to sell the urn. Because apparently he was downstairs and then saw her leaving and came up and somehow beat her to her own office? Yeah, I don't know. There's literally no explanation as to why he is in her office. Yeah, none. But she says that, that he should leave and he gets upset and smacks the bookshelf. And I love my notes was, what did those books ever do to you? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. And... He's like, no, you know, you don't understand. You have to sell it before the curse. And she's like, curse? What curse? And he says, the urn is cursed. But never mind. I'll, I'll get rid of it myself. But the way he says it really amused me because he's like, the urn, it's cursed. <laughs> yeah. And he, didn't he like have a head tilt on there? Like, yeah, it was a it little was weird. weird. It was very weird. So he walks toward the urn to grab it. And she decides, fine, you think it's cursed? Let's make it cursed. And she uses her powers and moves the urn. No, except... She was not intending to move it in the manner that it moved. Because then, when it moves, she is super, like, fucking surprised. No, no, no. She's acting surprised. I don't think that was that. No, I think she's acting surprised. Because she she moves it and goes, oh my god, it is cursed. Like, she's... She's acting surprised. Okay, I I found that it, it was a little ambiguous as to what was going on there, because it could have gone that she was trying to make it do something, and it was doing not what she wanted, and then she's like, shit, like, there's something about this fucking urn, this is weird. No, I think I think it was just she was trying to act. That, that does make sense, but still, it was just like, yeah. what I had written down was, why would she try to move it? Because he thinks it's cursed. Well, he thinks it's cursed, yes. Yeah, like... he thinks it's cursed. And and so, and so she now knows that there's something up with it, that if he thinks it's cursed and is willing to take it to get rid of it, that she's got to do something. Okay. Because, you know, she's like, you know, oh my God, it is cursed. And he's like, oh no. And so she then she moves it again. And she does that slightly worse acting of, what's going on? You know, that kind of thing. Sometimes with this show, I just don't differentiate between types of acting. Yeah. Unless it's, like, really, really different. Yeah. And I'm just like, eh, it goes all under this category. I'm like, whatever. Yeah. 
So she's all, what's going on? And, you know, he's like, the curse, it's happening. It's too late. I gotta get out of here. And he runs out of the room and she looks at the urn. And then we see that there's also a spider sketch. Yeah. A spider etching, I guess, on the urn. And then we cut to Phoebe and Piper getting off what I'm assuming is a streetcar, but I'm not going to count it toward the total because it could have been a bus. It's not a clear enough picture. And Phoebe is wearing... A long dark jacket with long sleeves and a large furry collar. Mm hmm. We love them furry collars. Uh huh. And the shirt underneath looks to be a tan v neck, and her shoes are cream heels. She may have had white tights on, too, because there looked to be like a tattoo on her foot, but it was kind of blurry, mm-hmm. like it was covered in like white tights. Yeah. And Piper is in a tan jacket and is wearing a black top, floral skirt, black tights, and black heels. Sorry, did you say tan jacket, floral skirt? I did indeed. Oh dear. It was very funny. Oh dear. Yes. Very, very funny. And this entire scene seems to be 80 yard and is completely exposition time. Oh my goodness. Uh-huh. Phoebe wants to know if Piper believes in giving people second chances. And Piper says that she does, absolutely, and that's why she wants to help Doug out so much. And blah, blah, blah. And that Clay says he can change and I want to believe him, blah, blah, blah. You know, all that sort of stuff. And Piper says that her premonition was definitely in the future. And Phoebe says that the problem is she keeps thinking about the past. And she has this moment saying, you know, that when she moved to New York, she was angry and scared and that she met Clay and he helped her out and that he was really good to her in a time in her life when no one else was. And Piper just gives her this look like, bitch, what? Like, what do you mean? No one else was. Like, excuse me? Mm Mm-hmm. I am your sister. Uh Uh-huh. And Phoebe's like, no, you know I didn't mean it like that, you know. And Piper says it's fine and asks why she left Clay. And she says that he kept living beyond his means. (laughs) And that he never thought of the future. And she goes, yeah, I know, it sounds familiar. (laughs) Which was funny. But yeah, that he got involved with some bad people and she just couldn't take it anymore. So she had to leave. And I guess that would have been the start of her leaving New York. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Because it would have taken her a while to get from New York to San Fran, especially if she was going by bus. Uh Uh-huh. With her bike. Uh Uh-huh. And a duffel bag. Indeed. Hopefully she didn't have eight heads in them, though. (laughs) It's such a good movie. Oy. Yeah. I don't think I've seen it all the way through. Don't know. It's just fucking hilarious. Mm-hmm. My dad made me watch it. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's funny. But yeah, so Phoebe asks, you know, like, what if he's the one? Do I just walk away? You know. Uh, and we get. You already a, did. Yeah. And we get a cute sister moment, which I lovingly wrote in my notes as CSM incoming. Yup. Where Piper's like, no. And Phoebe says, we can't live together forever. What? Do we expect to be 60 years old and still be sharing clothes and a cat? Yeah. Which I thought was super funny. And Piper comes back with, now that you put it that way, no, I don't want to live with you anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Which was just very funny. It was a cute sister moment. And, like, you could totally see that they had the chemistry of sisters. It was great. Yes. And they walk inside Quake, and Doug is at the bar shaking a little cocktail shaker, and he does a little spin. There's a shit ton of women standing at the bar. Oh, so many women. Yeah. Because, hey, cute dude, floppy hair, can apparently really mix drinks. Yes, I am staying right here. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love Phoebe's line of, I thought your charm was to boost his confidence, not turn him into Tom Cruise. (laughs) And Piper's like, maybe I shouldn't have doubled the recipe. (laughs) No, you really shouldn't have. No, not at all. And they walk up to the bar and Piper asks what's going on. And Doug's like, not sure, but whatever it is, I feel great. (laughs) And Shelly walks up to the bar to grab a tray of drinks. And Doug grabs one of the drinks off the tray and pushes it down the bar to the end. But clearly they, like, share a Yeah, they a share, moment. like, a little moment. Uh, it's a weird moment. Yeah. Where Shelly's like, who is this dude? And Doug what? is like, I kind of want to impress her, but also I want to show her that I don't need her. Yeah. And a woman at the end of the bar is, thanks, Doug. Gotta love that ADR yeah. extras. And Shelly walks away holding the tray with the most disgusted look on her face. Yeah. Oh, it was bad. And Piper asks him, you know, like, what about Shelly? And he comes back with, who cares about Shelly when I've got Thursday, Friday, and Saturday all lined up and waiting? And I wanted to punch him in the yes. face. Yes. Yes. Oh, man. 
And then isn't this the point where he finally sees Phoebe is there? Uh-huh. Turns to Phoebe. He's like, I don't believe I've had the pleasure. I don't believe you will. Off limits. <laughs> yeah. Gotta love Piper. Piper just puts her fucking foot down. Yep. And he puts his hands up in this little, like, I surrender position. He's like, uh-huh. No problem, no problem. It was mm-hmm. great. It was great. And he walks away, and Phoebe's like, Yo, your charm worked. You turned Doug into a... And Piper comes back with, A monster. <laughs> it was great. And then Phoebe kisses Piper on the cheek, says that she has to go meet Clay over at the house, and she leaves. And we get an establishing shot of a hotel, which you can tell, because it says hotel on a sign. Of course. And they push in on the sign that says hotel <laughs> in case you missed it. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I guess this is supposed to be supposed to be the Ashcraft. Yes. Palmer walks into his room and we see the sketch of the woman from the urn is on the back of the door. Ha. And the guardian of the urn appears in a cloud of gold dust as Palmer is trying to pack his things. And he asks, you know, how'd you get here? And I just loved her line of, I came here with your friend. I waited for your fear to consume you. (laughs) Which was just, just great. And she asks where the urn is. And he says it's at the auction house. And that he tried to get it back. He was going to return it, I swear. You know. (laughs) Yeah. And she touches a brooch on her shawl that happens to be a scorpion. And we get a lovely CGI scorpion. Yep. And she puts it on him, and it stings him, and again with the line of you're being punished for your greed. Mm-hmm. As he tries to say, I'm sorry! You know. Yeah, yeah, sure you are, dude. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to a night shot of the manor. And in Phoebe's room, Clay is sitting on the bed, and Phoebe is picking out a dress. And we can now see that the outfit that she had on under the long jacket is indeed a tan v-neck shirt that's both v-neck in the front and the back. Oh, yeah. And a dark gray skirt. And they're talking about going to see a band. And this had to have been a 90s thing. The band goes on at 10, but if we get there before 9, there's no cover. Lovely. I'd go. That has to be a 90s thing. Like, get there early, no cover kind of thing. Because I don't, I don't, when my drinking days happened in the 20s, in the 20s, in the 2000s, I don't remember that being a thing. But who knows? She says, you interested? And he replies, in anything that involves you. And I wanted to smack him. So she gives him a look and he smiles. And then she holds up two dresses, a long gray and black one and a short red one and basically holds them up for him to choose. And he picks one. He picks the long one and she throws it to the ground, picking the other one. And they both laugh. And he starts with Deja and she comes out with Vu. Hi, oh, it was so cheesy. Yep. And he says that he misses this, the day to day of us. And I just want to <laughs> oh smack my God. him in the head. This is not an ABC sitcom, guys. Yeah, it was- it was bad. And then she's like, okay, well, I'm going to change now. And he's like, okay. And she kind of nods her head to the door. He's like, oh, you want me to leave? <laughs> and it just made me laugh. It's like, yes, we're not together. Get your ass out of my house. Leave. Leave now. Yep. But, you know, she's like, well, yeah, kind of, you know, whatever. And, and he pulls her to the bed to have her sit down. And he starts kissing her neck. And music starts to play. <laughs> There's a needle drop. Yeah. And she's okay with it for a moment. And then she stops him. And he okay, stops. stop. And the music stops. And she's like, okay, go, go. And he continues kissing her neck. And the music picks back up. It was just, it was great. Yep. And it cuts away. Well, it cuts away with them, you know, that she's trying to, trying to not, but it doesn't work. And he kisses her on the lips and they lay down and then we cut to the living room. And Piper's got the Book of Shadows and she's writing something. And Prue walks in the uh-huh. front door. Which apparently scares Piper. Still not sure exactly why that was a thing, but all right. And Prue asks where Phoebe is and Piper's like, upstairs, but you might want to. But Prue's already gone up the stairs knock. And we cut to upstairs and Prue barges into Phoebe's room saying, we need to talk. And she sees Phoebe and Clay in bed together and Phoebe's like, yes, we do. And then Prue pulls a disgusted face and walks back outside and we get a commercial break. Now here's the thing. You walked into your sister's room. Not a knock, not a, not anything. You just barge in. You are not allowed to look disgusted. Correct. You're just not. 
Although I find it funny that for once, like, Phoebe saw her vision from what ended up being Prue's perspective. Yeah. Which was kind of interesting. Yeah. But she always kind of sees her visions from an outsider's perspective. This is true. That isn't necessarily her own. Well, I know her first one was from hers because it was the two rollerbladers. And that was effectively her perspective. I mean, well, you could argue it might not have been, but, you know, it, she was another person there. It couldn't have been any any other person's perspective. True. Very true. So we come back from the commercial break with another exterior shot of the manor. And Phoebe is now wearing a cream-colored, yellow-colored, I'm not sure. It was a V-neck, three-fourth sleeve top and jeans. And Clay, who's wearing dark pants, a gray button-down shirt, and his leather jacket, are standing in the doorway. Prue is standing nearby. And Phoebe's like, you don't have to leave. And he's like, I should. And then Piper walks up to stand next to Prue. And Phoebe and Clay kiss. And she's like, I'll call you. And he leaves. And Phoebe closes the door, turns to Prue and says, I hope you liked the show. Tat. Which was just like, ah. Prue's like, I'm sorry, I had no idea. And we get the line where Phoebe was me in this moment. She's like, what? That it was my room that you barged into? <laughs> it's like... Duh. She says she had more privacy when she lived in New York, a tiny island crawling with 8 million people. Are there really 8 million people in New York? Let's see what it's like now. Because I just don't know. It just seems like an overestimate to me. 2013, 8.406 million. Huh. But would that mean that there were 8 million in 1999? 7.5 million in 99. So not much lower. Interesting. Like, I could see her rounding up to eight. Interesting. It just didn't occur to me that there would be that many people. Apparently, in 99, there were 2.8 million people in Chicago, but 2013, there were 2.7. I can see people moving out of Chicago. Yeah. This is true. So... She says she has more privacy when she lived in New York with 8 million people. And Prue comes back with, and at least one thief. Because her boss handed her the paper that said that he didn't buy it at some outdoor bazaar, that he stole it. And Phoebe's like, it can't be right, you know. And Piper's like, yeah, it looks right. And Prue comes with a line of, seasons change, people don't. Which is, is a horrible, horrible inaccuracy. Yeah. Yeah. Extremely hypocritical yeah. and inaccurate. Yep. And even Phoebe comes back with, I changed. Yeah. Don't you remember what you thought of me before I walked back through the door? And Prue says it's different because you're my sister. Nah. Like, no, bitch, listen. <laughs> people change. And that's a good thing that people change. Yes, it is. Like, you I'm not change. the same person I was in high school. Oh, no. You know, I'm sure you're not the same person you were in high school. I'm sure our listeners aren't the same people they were in high school. Blue, however, is much the same dog that he was when we got him. Yeah? Yeah. He's a little less nervous, gets along better with small kids, and tolerates dogs. Like, he won't- he no longer does that thing when he gets too close to them where he just completely flips his shit. Yeah. Like, he'll bark, 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 but he won't then suddenly, like, y not yodel, but, you know, like, do that bark where he he's in pain. Like, like it sounds a yowl. like- yeah, hmm. like a yowl, yelp sort of thing. Yeah. He doesn't do that anymore when he gets close to dogs. Well, that's good. So Phoebe says there's got to be some sort of mistake. And Prue says that it gets worse, that there's a curse attached to the urn, that anyone who steals it ends up dead because the guardian who protects it feeds off the greed of the victims. After their fear has consumed them, I assume that's like a pre-digestive? Maybe. Yeah. Like, it's it's a it's an enzyme to break down all that delicious, delicious greed. Yeah, must be. But Phoebe says that Clay never could have known about the curse, otherwise he wouldn't have brought it here. And Piper's like, are you sure you wouldn't be the first Halliwell to misjudge a guy? And Piper should know, you know. But Phoebe's like, it's not about judging, it's about knowing, and I know him, and, you know, whatever. And Prue's like, he put my job at Jeopardy, he lied to me, and he lied to you. And then she sighs because Phoebe's like, you don't know that. You know, and the last line of the scene is, I'm not saying he's perfect, but even if he was foolish enough to risk his own life, he would never risk mine. And then she walks away and it's like, how would she be even involved in this? She didn't steal the fucking thing. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, yeah, yeah, whatever. So then we cut back to the hotel. Mm -hmm. And the police are in Palmer's room, and the coroner is looking at the sting on Palmer's neck, and Andy is there in a boring black suit. And the coroner, the actor, is what my mother would lovingly call a Valentine Jenicky. He's been in a bunch of stuff, but you never know his name. He's a that guy. Yeah, exactly. Wasn't he Asian? Yeah. 
His name is Ming Lo, in case you're wondering. Okay. But yeah, he's been in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And the coroner says, you know, that's a scorpion sting. And Andy's like, scorpion? San Francisco? I love how much of an expert this guy is apparently on stings. Like, it's a puncture wound. You can't tell curvature unless you're, like, putting a mold into the wound. Yeah, who knows? Your, like, lividity is not going to tell you much of anything. It's certainly not going to narrow it down that much. I mean, there are some insects where the bite wounds end up being pretty distinctive. Like, I know uh, chigger marks tend to be pretty obvious, Mm. but those are a North American thing as far as I know. The fact that they leave, like, a specific kind of ring or whatever, like, the enzymes in the bite dissolve in a certain way that it's very obvious to people who know what it looks like that this is a chigger bite. Mm. That it would look different from, like, a mosquito bite or a spider bite or a snake bite. Interesting. That's why ringworm is so obvious, because it leaves rings. Like It it must like them. Yeah, yes. Because it put a ring on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, I can pun too, damn it! Yeah, that's where Sonic got his obsession. (laughs) With ringworms? Yes. Okay. It wormed his way into its heart. There you go. Anyway, we're so bad. Yes, we are. So bad. Take a drink. so good at it. Yes. Right, Blue? You want to play the drinking game? No. You say a bad pun and you take a drink? Puppy cannot have alcohol. I don't have to have alcohol. I don't have alcohol. You can get drunk on water. It's fine. Anyway, so I love the line that Andy says where he goes, I'll buy it. This place has roaches. Not so sure about scorpions, <laughs> which was funny. And the coroner also says that he found a business card in the dude's pocket for Buckland. Ah, let me guess. <laughs> Prue Halliwell. Yeah, how'd you know? I'm cursed. <laughs> it is great. And Andy leaves and literally bumps into Clay on his way out. And Clay looks into the room and sees Palmer getting zipped into a body bag. And of course, as you do, he's all, Palmer? Oh, like, with this heartbroken expression on his face. Like, oh, poor Clay. No. Yeah. And then we cut to Buckland's with an exterior shot. Brown suit lady is there, and the red umbrella girl is also there, but she seems to be missing her umbrella. But who's that in the background? Is it going into the door? Floral skirt lady? It is indeed. She really does get (gasps) around town. Yep. This is why I cannot do a tally for tan jacket floral skirt lady, because she literally is showing up fucking everywhere now. So, in Prue's office... A cloud of gold dust floats through, and the picture appears back on the urn, and Prue walks in, wearing dark gray pants, a light tan turtleneck, and leather jacket, and Claire walks in behind her in a brown dress suit, and she's reading off the numbers and the prices of the things at the auction, and of course, the things that she's reading are the last two that we already had numbers for, because gotta do that. And gets to lot 51 and excluded. And then she sees the urn and is like, shouldn't that be turned into the proper authorities? Oi. But Prue says that she's contacting customs as soon as they're finished. And that she wants to assure her that she didn't have anything to do with it. And Claire's like, just handle it. Which is totally what a manager would do. Just be like, I don't want to deal with it. You just handle it. Like, you clearly know this system much better than I do. And you've been here way fucking longer. You know what needs to be done. I'm not going to punish you unless it causes serious repercussions. Exactly. So Claire asks how they did at the auction, and Prue says they made $1.28 million, which, you know, is just enough. Yeah. All this shit they just apparently had. Lying around, yeah. You know, there was no cover for her, just, you know. Yep, that they were able to do in a day. That they, yeah, a bunch of crap that they literally just had lying on hand. Yep. That apparently they was already paid for. There was no additional expenses. Yep. Like, I don't know how fucking auction houses work. But I don't it doesn't know. sound like this. Yeah, I don't know. But whatever. So... Claire says the auction house lives to see another day, and they shake hands, and she I was leaves. half expecting her to say, we'll do this again next week. Yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. And she leaves, and Prue glances at the urn, and we get an insert shot of the sketch of the woman on there. And then Which Andy walks so in. Which is clearly in a different color blue. Yep. yep. And awkwardly placed. Like, it's not centered or anything. It doesn't look like it should be there. Well, none of the etchings on it really look like they should be there. Because they're not etchings. Yeah. They're, you know. It's paint. Yeah. It's all paint. Yes. 
so Andy walks in and Prue's like, here to arrest me again, which I thought was kind of funny. And he happens to see the scorpion on the urn and is like, why am I not surprised? Sometimes the writers do something like they're trying to hint that Andy already knows, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't. Yep. And it's just, it's just a line there for the audience that has no purpose. Mm-hmm. Like this, like the whole thing back in Dream Sorcerer, where he's like, "Glad to see every bone in your body isn't broken." Like, Pru didn't know that was that was a useful. Line. Like, I'm, but again, it still we bothers talk- me. We talked about that because remember, well, yes, he knows, but there's no reason to say that line. Glad to see you're alive. Glad to see your skull isn't caved in. Like, but every bone in your body is not broken. That is so specific. I know I'm rehashing this from like <laughs> six episodes ago. I cannot help it. Yeah. But the whole, hey, look, a scorpion guy was killed by a scorpion. These are clearly related things. I just don't buy that he would be wanting to connect it to Prue. He would might well. I it's buy, not that he, if he wants would be like, to. It's that it keeps happening. It keeps connecting to Prue. Yes, but the way in which he mentions it sounds like he knows, but he doesn't. Well, you know, it's just it's just weird writing that's clearly just audience pandering. Well, yeah, it's you know, I don't yeah. know that I approve. Well, it's too late to change it now. I know. We just have to deal or no deal. All right. So he's supposedly not surprised about the scorpion picture on the urn. And Prue's like, I don't understand. And he says, yeah, young man died last night of a scorpion sting. And we learned that the guy's name was apparently Palmer Kellogg, which is an interesting sounding name. Andy asks if she knew him. And Prue's like, I don't think so. And Andy's like, well, he obviously knew you because I found your card on his body. And she's like, well, we did just have an auction. So I met a lot of people. Tons of people. Yeah. And he says that he'll bring a photo by later to see if it jogs anything, which is just, it's such a weird phrase that. Yeah. And she says that that's fine. And he turns to leave and then stops himself and is like, just because we're not dating anymore, I want you to know I still care about you. And you can always call me, blah, blah, blah. And I just love her. She's like, I know. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. And then we cut back to the hotel with another exterior shot. And this time Clay is packing his things all quick like. And someone knocks on the door. Surprise! It's Phoebes. Uh-huh. With hair clips. Yeah. That hair. Tiny little butterfly clips. Except I think they were flowers, weren't they? Yeah, I think they were little flowers. She's wearing a pink top and a burgundy fuzzy jacket with a black furry collar. That's right. Fuzzy jacket furry color. Yeah. So 90s. Someone got arrested by a bunny. Mm-hmm. That's one furry collar. Yes. Anyway, so she's standing at the door and is like, you stole the urn, didn't you? And he's like, why don't you come inside? And she's like, no, I'm not going anywhere until you answer the question. And he's like, okay, yes. And so she walks inside because he answered the question. Yeah. Uh-huh. And she asked if he was planning on saying goodbye before he skipped town. And he completely bypasses that question and just is like, Palmer's dead. <laughs> Died from a scorpion sting. I called Wesley to tell him and that's when his parents told me he's dead too. Spider bites. Like, I'm not going to stick around. Done. I'm out of here. She calls him a liar and he's like, not a liar. Yeah, you kind of are. You know, he says he's not lying and she's like, you knew the urn was cursed when you stole it. And he's like, what are you talking about? She's like, you're telling me that you didn't know whoever steals the urn dies. And he's like, I swear I didn't know anything about that. And she's all, yeah, right. And he's, you know, you have to believe me, you know, and like these stories always go. And she's like, no, I don't. You're always a liar, blah, blah, blah. And she leaves. It's like, why is it always that nobody ever listens to both sides of a story? Like, why is that? Because how else are you going to have conflict unless someone is telling the truth, but they're not believed? Yeah, I guess so. I just... Once a liar. Always a liar. Am I right? Uh Uh-huh. And then we're outside Quake and tan jacket floral skirt lady. She moves fast because here she is again. Woo! Uh-huh. And Piper is sitting at the bar in the usual Quake outfit, but now she has a black blazer on top, you know, as you do. Mm-hmm. Although that blazer with the vest, with the shirt, would be super classy. Kind of sexy. Yeah, it would be. And Doug is putting glasses on the shelf, and he sees Shelly and then drops a glass. He's like, 
sorry, I'll go get a broom. Walks back behind the bar. Uh-huh. And Phoebe comes up to Piper and is like, I see you reversed the spell. And Piper's like, yeah. And I've been given until tomorrow to fire him. And Phoebe's like, oh, you know, maybe Prue's right. Maybe they don't belong together. Seems the theme of the day. Which is just... Uh, it's only the theme of the day if you're forcing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Piper immediately knows she's talking about Clay. And Phoebe's like, he used me to get to Prue. And Piper says she's sorry. And Phoebe's like, thanks for not saying I told you so. Which is a lovely, like, mm-hmm. gesture. Yeah. And they have a little bit of, you know, random talking about stuff and talking about guys and talking about Doug. And, you know, the Doug is kind of boring on the surface, but maybe in the long run we're better off with that type. And Phoebe's like, I'm still looking for adventure, but maybe blah, blah, blah. You know. And then. And then there's a crash. Yeah. And you just hear Doug in the background. I got it. (laughs) Which is great. Doesn't he pop out from the back with a broom and a dustpan? He's like, "I, I got this. Yeah, yeah. It was very funny. And, you know... Oh, because Piper said, you know, you risk paying the price if she wants adventure. And then they hear the crash. (laughs) And Piper's like, maybe it's a price worth paying. And Phoebe's like, you know, I don't know anymore. And then, you know, she says, thanks for the ear. And does this, like, caress of her face. Yeah, yeah. Weird little face stroke. Yeah, it was a cute, caring way. But it was a little weird between sisters. Yeah. Just a tiny bit weird. Yeah. Between sisters. Yeah, Unless you've established that these sisters have that kind of a physical relationship, it's just a little weird. Yeah, slightly odd. Mm -hmm. And then we cut to the manor later that night, and the doorbell rings, and Phoebe answers it to Clay, and he asks if he can come in, and Phoebe immediately says no, and he says, you know, I might have lied about buying the urn, but I swear I didn't know it was cursed. And she's like, well, that still makes you a thief, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, "Uh uh-huh. Yeah, a bit of a liar. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Because he lied about where he got it. Exactly. And he says, that's why I'm here. I want to turn myself into the police. To which she rolls her eyes, which I thought was funny. And he's like, I mean it. It's the only way I can redeem myself with you. Hi, Clay. Laying it on a little thick there, Clay. She wants to know how she doesn't know that it's just one of his scams. And he's like, well, I guess you don't. But I want to take the urn to the police, and there's no way that Prue's going to give it to me without you there. So, you know, one last favor, please, kind of thing. And with the please, he touches her arm, and she gets a premonition of him getting attacked by a snake in Prue's office. Which, she's just like, the curse. And he's like, what? <laughs> she's like, let's go! And W-T then we fuck? Yeah. And then we cut to Buckland's because, you know, can't stay in one place too long. And so, yeah. So Prue's in her office. Phoebe and Clay walk in. And we get a cute little moment where Prue asks what he's doing there. And Phoebe comes back with, save it till later. I've seen the future and it's not bright. Yeah. Which was funny. And she says, you know, you didn't give the urn to the police. And she goes, no, you know, I thought it might get you in trouble. And Phoebe's like, well, you know that little legend we were talking about. And then the guardian appears. and She goes, I think it's true. Yeah. Good and- timing. Yep. Just a la convenience. Absolutely. And, you know, Clay is very confused, and they're pushing him out the door, and Prue tries to use her power on the Guardian, but it just makes her turn her head a little bit. Like she's been vaguely slapped? Yeah. And, and she's just clearly a little annoyed. Yeah. She's Not like, even miffed, just like, Roy. Yeah. Because she doesn't want to harm them, because she came for the thief. And then Prue asks who she is, and she says, I am the guardian of the urn. You cannot destroy me. And Prue tries to use her power again, and she does get pushed back a a little bit. But not much. Not much. Which causes Prue to be like, uh, we should Uh, run. Ah, yeah. We should run. Bye-bye. We should run right now. And they run outside. And the guardian, before disappearing back onto the urn, says, so now there are more who will die. Okay, now here's my question. They obviously didn't steal her. Yeah, like, what, because they're, like, hiding the guy who did it? They have to die, too? Like, I don't, I didn't understand that particular thing. And then we cut to commercial. And when we come back from commercial, we have a night shot, and we get the manor, and Prue, Phoebe, and Clay walk through the front door, and Clay's like, I don't understand, like, what's going on? And Piper walks into the foyer wearing a black turtleneck and jeans. Yep. Uh Uh-huh. And she's like, what's going on? And Prue takes her and they head to the attic. She's like, I'll tell you on the way, you know? And Phoebe's like, fill her in. I'll meet you guys upstairs. And turns to Clay, who still wants to know what's going on. Because Piper's really into legends and Prue's really good with her mind. 
Like, uh, why does she think this is a thing that's going to work? Like, I just... Yeah. I don't... Yeah, I don't get it. But yeah, so Clay's like, you know, that guardian thing, she's not even... And Phoebe ends with, human? Yeah, I know. But she's real, and we need to figure out how to stop her. <laughs> Which was fun. I, I liked that moment. That was cute. And Clay says that he doesn't want her to get hurt because of him. And she says, you know, I think I actually believe you. And then she smiles and runs upstairs, leaving him downstairs. Because she's a moron. Yep. Why did she think he was going to stay? Because she's a moron. Yeah, I just, yeah. But then we cut to the attic, and Prue and Piper are flipping through the Book of Shadows when Phoebe comes in, asking if they found anything. And Piper's like, nothing about Egyptian urns or greed demons, which I thought was funny. Mm -hmm. And Prue hopes that she didn't follow them to the manor because their powers are useless against her. And Piper comes back with, how is that possible? I mean, that's never happened to us before. And just like in episode nine, yep. it's like, that's because you've only been witches for a short period of time. Yeah. Of course it hasn't happened to you before. You've been witches for less than six months. Uh-huh. Like, come on. You're not going to have known the entire gamut of yeah. what you will encounter. In fact, me thinks this would be a theme for the entire show. Uh-huh. Absolutely. So Prue says that maybe they're not supposed to protect him, and Phoebe gets kind of annoyed by that, and Prue's like, you know, I'm just saying there's a reason, you know, like Piper trying to force Doug and Shelly back together. Maybe there's just some things we're not supposed to save. And Phoebe's like, no, we're saving Clay. Yeah, Prue, period. fuck like, you. Yeah. We're doing this shit. Like, there's got to be something we're missing. And Piper, still looking in the book, she goes, well, maybe this is something, you know, there's no talk of an urn, but it does talk about the seven deadly sins, greed being one of them. And Prue, for some reason, all of a sudden has a thought of, well, wait, if the Guardian punishes the greedy, maybe if Clay does something selfless, it'll even the score. Yeah. Because that's how that works, apparently. Because this is all, like, you know, checks and balances. Yeah, I this still... Is fucking arithmetic. Yeah, still don't exactly... It's algebra. Yeah. Which, granted, was invented in the Middle East. It was indeed. But I like that, that Prue says, you know, that if Clay does something selfless, it'll even the score. And Piper's like, good luck. And they both just kind of give her a look. And she's like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cute sister moment. It was super duper funny. It was adorable. And then they go downstairs. And, of course, Clay is gone. You know. As you do. As you do. And they're trying to figure out where he could have gone. And Phoebe then remembers her vision is like, I think I know where he went. And we cut to Buckland's. In Prue's office, the Guardian appears just as Clay walks in, a la convenience. Well, she knew he was coming. Uh-huh. And, and she says as much. She does indeed. But she says that she knew he'd come back because his greed consumes him. And he's like, I'm not here for the urn. Bitch, please. Uh-huh. And she's unwrapping a gold bracelet from her wrist. Yep. And, you know, with the, you must be punished. And he's like, I know. <laughs> like, let's cut to the chase, lady. Yep. He goes, but when you're done with me, you're not going to hurt anyone else, right? And she goes, not unless someone steals the urn again. And they always do. And they always do. She throws the bracelet down and it turns into a snake at Clay's feet. And you gotta love that green screen action. Oh, oh yeah. Uh -huh. We get some little cobra. Yeah. Actually, not a very little cobra either. It was a pretty big cobra, but it was it was uh, lovely green screen action. So much. Uh-huh. And then the sisters run in because, you know, as you do, I guess, a la convenience, if you will. And Phoebe tries to run to him and he's like, stay back. And the snake goes to bite Phoebe for some reason, as opposed to Clay. She moved. I guess. And Clay puts his arm up in front of her and the and snake disappears. Yeah, it kind of like almost gets to his arm and then suddenly turns into gold dust and just floats off. Yeah. And Phoebe comes back with a selfless act. Just like the Book of Shadows said. No, it didn't. No, no, no. Your sister said that, you fucking moron. <gasps> <gasps> well, she left him alone, and she's misquoting the book. Yeah, yeah. she's The just... writers could have done a better job on this one. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. But the Guardian and the Urn disappear in a burst of golden dust. Yes. Uh-huh. And then... Piper asks where the Urn went. Oh, yeah. And Prue's and then... like, who cares as long as it's not here? Yeah. Which was then very we funny. Cut back to the old dead man's house in Cairo, yep. and the where urn it appears, appears back on the stand, which is a handy way not to go through customs again. Yeah, 
Absolutely. See, I want to know how they got it through customs in the first place. Because if it's stolen, that's probably why it took them three days to get to San Francisco. Yeah, because it shouldn't have. Actually, that could have been why they ended up in San Francisco instead of New York at first. They might have gone like through China or something. I honestly have no idea. Because if you go to like Beijing, fly to Beijing, and then and then you could go through customs in like Hawaii or something. I know not. Because I know there are flights f- directly from California to Australia. That's a pretty large distance. So you could have gotten a direct flight from Australia. But yeah, if you go through enough customs port, if, as long as you forge it in one customs port, they're not going to, yeah. probably not going to super check. Yep, don't know. But then we go and we get the exterior of Quake. Because we're in, I think, the final scene? Yeah. In the final scene yes. of the episode. Yes, we are. We are indeed. We get the exterior of Quake and... Hand jacket floral skirt lady walks by. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the girls are sitting at the bar. I love my notes. Piper has a green sweater set going on. <laughs> I just, I love that. Prue is in a long sleeve red top, and Phoebe is in a blue no sleeve top for some She doesn't like sleeves all that much. Yeah, they're like some three quarter or non existent. Yeah, absolutely. And Piper's saying that it was a good thing they didn't have to use their powers to vanquish her. Otherwise, Clay would have seen. And Prue's like, well, but our powers didn't work against her anyway. And Phoebe's like, that is not something I hope ever happens again. Yeah, because it fucking sucks. Yep. And then Doug walks along holding a tray of glasses and Shelly walks near him. And Piper's like, oh no, forgot about Doug. And he drops the tray and Piper freezes it in midair. And Prue's like... This is getting ridiculous. Yes. Piper's like, you know, that engagement ring's probably still burning oh, yeah, a hole yeah. in his apron. So Prue gets the bright idea, walks over, and we see this great little bit of green screen Prue, who's clearly not scaled correctly against Doug. Like, yeah. it's off by just a little bit. Yeah, it was a little Reaches awkward. into the vague area where we think his pocket is, so basically the crotchular region. Yep. And then places it on the ground, runs back over. Yes. And... And we see her outfit. The long sleeve red top is sheer over a red cami. And she's wearing a dark red skirt with a short slit up the back. Yep. And flats. (laughs) Which is different for her. Yes, it is. I think this is the first time we've seen her in flats. Not counting the time she was running down the stairs in gym shoes. When she was supposed to be wearing heels. We know she doesn't live in an apartment, so. Yeah. So no flats there. Ugh. Bad. Hence the grin. So bad. Anyway, Piper's like, what are you doing? And she's like, solving your problem and keeping you employed, which I thought was very funny. Mm-hmm. And as she sits back down, they unfreeze. The tray falls to the floor. Glass crashes everywhere. Uh-huh. And Shelly notices the blue box on the floor and is like, what's that? And she picks it up and opens it and gasps. And he says he was carrying it around for weeks, trying to find the right time to ask you. And she's like, ask me What? And what comes the fuck back, do you think? And he goes back with, to, um, marry me? And this is where she goes, that's why I broke up with you. I gave up on waiting. Seriously, I do not understand this shit. Like, this is what happens when people expect the guy to just up and propose without discussing it. Exactly. Like, like if you think it's on a marriage track... Talk. Talk about it, yeah. Like, hey, I think this is where this is going. Is this where you want it to go? Is this where you think it's going? What's up? Yeah, I don't, I don't understand. I don't why. like, I don't like surprise proposals. Like, okay, the, well, the specific, the specific proposal, like the moment where you at physically ask with a fucking ring, that can be a surprise. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it's going to happen should not be. Yeah, when it happens could be a surprise, but I would like to know that it is going to happen. Yeah. Like, like, okay, I love how John Green told the story of him proposing to Sarah, like, comes up, <laughs> she's, <laughs> calls her up, and he's like, hey, you gotta come home right now, and she's like, oh, I was gonna stop by the post office to see if, like, the letter from, I don't know, fucking Yale or Harvard or whatever, yeah. had come in, and he's like, no, come home now, <laughs> she's like, okay, she stopped by the post office anyway, comes home, roses everywhere. And she's been accepted into, like, master's program or something. Yeah. And then he proposes, and then they call everyone, and everyone's like, well, we knew you were going to get married, but the the school is a surprise. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, thanks. All my hard work for naught. Yeah. But, you know, John Green had a very funny way of, of getting her to go out with him, too. Well, yeah. Well, okay, it was a the, little bit shitty. The, well, I just... The first, the first time was a bit shitty, and then the second time it was like, wait... 
So, so you're, you're, you're free. But it, the email one made me laugh so hard of emailing Sarah and a bunch of, of friends and be like, Hey, want to go to this movie? And then emailing everyone except Sarah, not you. <laughs> that was the best. <laughs> See, that's a little shitty. But the but fact that it didn't funny. really work. Yeah. Makes me feel better about it because then the next time around, yeah, like he finds out she's single yeah. and then, and then asks her out. Yeah. Like, but it okay, was just is super cool funny. She's like, yeah. It was super funny. <laughs> like, hey, everyone, want to go? Not you. <laughs> it was great. But yeah, so Shelly and Doug smile and hug, and Phoebe does the little tear rolling down the face gesture, which is kind of cute. Like, finger to the eye and down the cheek. It was super funny. And Piper comes back with the line of, this would have happened sooner if I would have kept my little Wicca nose out of their business. Yep. Oh, it was very cute. And of course... Then we get the weird moment where Phoebe's like, you know, you can't change people. They have to change themselves. And Prue comes back with, speaking of that, yum, as Clay walks up toward them. Oh, yeah. Like, what? So now you think he's cute? Yeah, like, I don't, I don't get it. Don't understand it. But we did have a cute moment, though, where Prue's just like, go, baby. And Piper's like, go, girl. It was just, go, girl. Yeah. It was very funny. I feel like we have not one an episode, but like one every couple of episodes where one of the sisters says, you go, girl, or some variation thereof, to the other. Yeah. So they laugh, and Phoebe walks up to Clay, and we see that her no-sleeve top is actually a no-sleeve hoodie. Yep. Because of course it is. Because 90s. Yep. Because why the fuck not? Yep. So they exchange hellos, or I should say haze, because they're both like, hey, hey, you know, very 90s. And Clay asks if there's any chance that she'll come back with him. And she's like, no, this is my home now. And he's like, you know me, I had to try. That's a better had to try than anything Rex ever fucking did. True. Or, wait, who else? Roger. Yeah. Uh, yeah, or Roger. Roger. Fucking Roger. Yeah. Yeah. You know me, Prue. I had to try. Yeah. Yes, and now I have to choke you. Yes. Yeah. And spit ink in your face. And spit super wink ink. Yeah, well, you know, it was a crap pen. That's all that means. <laughs> it was dyed water. Yes, it was indeed. But yeah, so he says that he knows that he lied to her about a lot of things, but he never lied about how much he cared about her. And she's like, I know. And then they kiss. And he's like, I guess I should be going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you should. Yeah. Dude. Leave. Leave yep. now. Yep. And she laughs at it, of course. And he has a weird line of... I hope the next time we cross paths, I'll be the guy you always think you see. Which is just a weird line. Like, I get what he means, but it's a weird line. Yeah. And then she caresses his face in a completely different way than she had caressed Piper's face earlier. Well, thank goodness. Yeah. And she says goodbye, and he leaves, and the girls walk up to her and ask if she's okay. And she's like, yeah, yeah, he was just stopping by on his way home. No big deal. It was a line that she had said earlier when he was just showing up. Yeah. And Piper's like, heard that before. And then they hug her, and we cut to the end credits. Yeah. Uh-huh. Another one of those slightly, what would we call this type of an ending? Anticlimactic. Kind of, but also kind of not. It's kind of like a because boring it's not, ending. Well, I mean, stuff happened, but it's not just like nothing has happened. Yeah. I don't know. It was... Tepid? Yeah, maybe. I like tepid. Let's call these tepid. All right. Tepid endings. All right. All right. So now we are at the ratings portion of our day. Mm-hmm. We didn't go on very many tangents today. But, you know, it happens. Mm -hmm. It depends on the episode, whether or not we get the opportunity to tangent. This is true. This episode, not so much. Correct. But, you know, it's all right. So, on to the ratings. Well, what did we learn today? <laughs> what did we learn today? We learned that the Sphinx is only about a half mile from the pyramids. Yeah, interesting. We learned that... Apparently, you can get priceless artifacts through customs, no problemo. Uh huh. We learned that it's possible to tell a scorpion sting from any other type of sting just by looking at the damn puncture wound. Yep. And we learned that Andy just can't get a break. Nope. When it comes to Prue. Nope. Yeah. Nope. All right. So, ratings. Mm hmm. Would you like to go first? No, you go first. I go first a lot. All right. I'm giving this episode 7 out of 10 gold lame boob covers. <laughs> uh, I was going to go with 7 out of 10 clearly rubber, not gold snake bracelets. Nice. 
I like it. Yeah. I like it. And and, and speaking of Lame boob covers, I have to say my favorite outfit was Egyptian NASA blanket. <laughs> yes. It was an interesting looking outfit. It just was super appropriative. Yeah, it was very um, costume. Yeah. Yeah. But as for outfits, I liked Prue's blue fuzzy hoodie. That looked itchy. But it was cute. Yeah, but it looked itchy. Yeah. For Phoebe, I liked the red shirt that Phoebe wore that showed off Alyssa's back tattoo. Oh, yeah. I just thought that was kind of fun. And for Piper, I didn't really care for any of her outfits today, so I think I'm just going to have to... I thought the vest was cute. Yeah, I think that's that's what I wrote, is I think I'll just go with the Quake outfit with the vest. Yeah. But, like, three of her outfits today were Quake outfits. Yep. We spent a lot of time at Quake. We did. With Doug. We did. And Shelly. And how boring are those names? Yeah, well, you know. Doug and Shelly. <laughs> God. They probably have a kid named Mark. There's nothing wrong with the name Mark. My cousin's name is Mark. All right. So that's us done for another week. Yeah. We are halfway through the season. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. So excited. I were halfway there. We're on the premiere. Take my paw. I don't want to give it to you, Mom. I swear. <laughs> Ow, oh. wow. Wow, 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 wow. So, on to the social media stuffs. Stuff and things, things and stuff. Yay, Lori. Yes. What? I'm doing stuff, Lori. Things. Oh, yes. So, as always, you can email us at charmchats at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, all those under Charm Chats. And you can get us on Twitter and Tumblr at Charm Chats Pod. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's about it. Yeah. There's not much more to mm-hmm. say or do. Yeah, and uh, if you want to... Hey, 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 guys. If you want to check out that, that their Patreon. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah, we'd, we'd be... We'd like that. We'd be able to afford stuff for the pod yeah. cast. Not yeah. the pod people, the podcast. Yes. If you would like, like to help like us out on chairs. Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> like better chairs and soundproofing. Yeah. Which would be utterly helpful. Because then we wouldn't have to worry about the fact that my roommates are making noise. Yeah. We just can't afford it right now. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Next week's episode is... uh, One of your least favorites. It's not one of my favorites. Okay. It's not necessarily one of my least favorites. But of the season? Of the season. Yeah. It's, It's not one of my favorites. Yeah. We've already been through my least favorite... Thank goodness I don't have to watch that one ever again. And then my second least favorite will be in a couple of, in like a month. Yeah. Month and a half. So. All right. So we are done for another week. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye. Blue, you say bye? No, we're still working on that. Yeah. It'll happen one of these days. Jesus. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Okay, guys. See you next week. Bye. Good night. Don't let the warlocks bite. Yeah. Phoebe